out of time. Okay. Um, I uh, wanted to share some um, examples of where wards and stakes are doing things that are particularly helpful on missions. Um, and just to give some context to that, I, I speak to you from, the, from my lofty former position as uh, the high priest group funeral coordinator. <laughs> so I <clears throat> just want to give, give you my church bona fides there. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I've really loved this, this six months as we've been reading the Gospels. Um, and to be able to, to feel as I'm reading that I'm a witness of Jesus as he walks and teaches and loves the people around him. <clears throat> I think of the, his encounter with the woman caught in adultery. And, uh, and the thing that strikes me about that is the very first thing that he did was to save her life. So those who wanted to stone her and kill her were shamed or had to honestly admit that they were not in a position to do that. But that was his first, the first thing he did in that circumstance was to make sure she would live and have an opportunity to move beyond it. You know, the second thing was that he taught and gave her hope. Neither do I condemn thee. And the third thing that he did was to trust her as she went about to live her life, that she would do the very best that she could. Go thy way and sin no more. And I think that gives us a great example in our engagement um, with all of our brothers and sisters, um, that especially those who come out when they're young, the, the very first need is to make sure that they're safe, that they will be alive, that, they, that their mental health needs are addressed and that they have a support structure in place in their family, in their ward, ideally in the school, that will keep them in a position to be able to stay alive. Um, and then we teach and give hope, and then we trust and support. There are three things that I would suggest maybe as ambitions that you could have in your ministry with LGBTQ folks. The first is um, that your experience with them will draw both them and you closer to the Savior. That in your engagement, how you will be able to help them feel the Savior's love for them, his knowledge of them, to have a personal experience and witness of his awareness of them and your experience in that process of being his hands to be certain that, they're, that they begin with that foundational knowledge. I think the second ambition um, really is to consider the entire family, especially as kids come out when they're young. Um, they have their own challenges in dealing with this but in some ways their parents' challenge is even greater because the parents are, are looking at it in two directions. One, it's how do I support and take care of my kid? And also, what are all the things that I'm worried about uh, in my kid's engagement? And, and so, especially in those early years, parents are gonna be hypersensitive to what gets said at church. And so, be aware and of the siblings, of the parents, of the individual um, as, as they come out when they're young that the whole family needs an embrace from the ward, uh, from the class, the quorum, the stake, that they feel that they're known and loved and welcomed, and we don't love them because they're going through a trial. We love them because they're our brothers and sisters. And we want to learn with them as they experience this thing that's gonna give them an entirely new perspective on the Savior's love. The third ambition I would have is that in this process, you make friends for the church. So however it ends, whatever the individual decides will be their right path. Do everything you can to make sure that if they feel they need to leave, they leave as a friend of the church. That they feel that they have been respected, heard, supported, honored, and that there will always be a place for them in your ward, in your family, in your class, in your quorum, in your stake. That we don't wait for them, as the Savior did not with the woman, uh, to make changes before we can love them, or we don't demand to see signs of their repentance or anything else. Our love is unconditional because we are 
acting in place of the Savior in his church. And, um, <clears throat> and I think, again, people are going to have their own path, their own way they need to find and learn in their experience in their lives. And that may take some out of the church. It did me for 25 years. It was a very long vacation. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, because of a family and because of church leaders and who had open hearts and were respectful of my journey, didn't require anything to proceed at a time or in a way that they would be comfortable with, uh, then I was able to continue my journey in the way that seemed best for me, my journey of learning in the process. So let me quickly give you, and I, and quickly is probably the operative word here. Um, okay, nine minutes. Um, and it would I'd be great if we have time for questions at the end. One example I wanted to share is when I was living in Salt Lake, um, there was a, an individual in our ward that we initially knew as Bradley. And, um, and Bradley presented um, in, in some ways in a, in, with more feminine clothing, but but kind of a masculine clothing. So it wasn't really hard to figure out that, that Bradley was in a transition process. And so being new to that ward, I watched and I wanted to see how people would engage with Bradley. And it was amazing to me that at every week I could identify two or three different people who would make a beeline over to visit with Bradley and to put their arms around and make sure that that uh, Bradley always had someone to sit with. Um, I sat with Bradley in choir. So I was in the bass section and, and Bradley was singing bass and we then came to know Eve. And Eve still kept that same seat in the choir, but presented now as a woman. And I loved how the ward continued to really put their arms around her and to make sure that she knew that she was welcome there and known um, that, that we really loved her. Unfortunately, she moved from the ward because her housing arrangements changed. And I saw her a few months later and said, Eve, how's the new ward? And she said, well, they just haven't made me feel like they want me to be there. They're sort of embarrassed to be around me or have me there. There's another transgender woman I know who, um, who started to attend Relief Society in a different ward. And uh, the Relief Society president said to the bishop, uh, there's a woman who's attending who came to Relief Society today, and I think she's transgender. And the bishop said to the Relief Society president, well, did she cause a disruption in your lesson? And the Relief Society president said no. And he said, well, then love her and make her feel welcome and make a place for her. And that ward really did, and just realized that, that she felt more comfortable in Relief Society, and that was the place that made sense for her to be. You know, in Matthew 25, when the Savior says, <clears throat> Inasmuch as you've done it unto one of the least of these, my sisters or brothers, you've done it unto me. I think about our transgender brothers and sisters. In a numerical sense, they represent probably less than half of the population. They are the least in that sense. And surely that is our opportunity to extend greater love and compassion and a desire to understand something that's really challenging for most of us to understand. But these are the ones the Savior would have us reach most critically, I think, and, and as a way for us to show our love for him. Um, <clears throat> Gina mentioned Fifth Sundays and stake and ward firesides. I, the thing I love about Fifth Sunday is um, everybody's there. So a fireside, generally people self-select. They come if they're interested, in my terminology, they're already converted to the cause of loving their LGBTQ brothers and sisters. But in a fifth Sunday, you've got the whole ward, including people who don't think it's their responsibility or desire to reach out in love and compassion to all of their brothers and sisters. So it's a chance to really have an impact more broadly there if you feel inspired to do that in your ward. Um, another example, the New York Manhattan Stake and Mission, uh, as I was living in Connecticut, the mission president and stake president got together and realized that in, in Manhattan, surprise, surprise, there are a lot of gay people. And lots of them were members of the church and lots of them were inactive. And so uh, the, the mid-singles branch um, and, the, and the stake president and the mission president 
got together and they assigned two sets of sister missionaries to that branch. And the branch president worked with them on identifying all the inactive ward members, but with the idea that as they went out to meet people, they would give a particular greeting and a welcome to those who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or queer. That they would specifically know that the branch president really wanted them to come and attend and there would be a place in Elders Quorum or in Relief Society for anyone who wanted to come. And the, the activity rate in the branch doubled as a result of that and it became a place that the people who lived outside that branch boundary or stake boundary started to come to because they knew that they would be welcomed. But I love the idea there that it was a partnership between the mission president, the stake president, the branch president to be able to do that work and really make it happen. Now, in honesty, I think I also say, at a certain point, I think all the leaders would say, well, but what's our message? Our message is welcome, our message is please be with us, we want you here, but then what do we say beyond that? And I think my answer to that would be, as you are inspired, to be sure that people have callings or ways to participate that make them feel that they're adding something to that congregation or community. Let them serve, let them teach, let them do whatever it is. Um, we have uh, members of Bishop Ricks and stake presidencies. The, the executive secretary does not have to be gay. There are other positions you can put a gay person <laughs> into. Um, just want you to know that it seems to be a common misconception that that's the only place you can put them. Um, and then the other thing I would just say is that, uh, that missionaries can serve openly. So kids who identify and come out before a mission can be open with their bishop and stake president in that interview process and uh, with their mission president as they arrive and with the help of the missionary department can expect to, to be welcomed and, and received um, with open arms by their mission president and, and companion. Um, it's uneven if we're honest about it, but if the, if the young man or young woman um, has done everything else that, that we would expect other young men or women to do in preparation for a mission, then that's, there is no impediment to a call. Um, I think you know, there can be uh, individual issues there and, and uh, there may be individual circumstances about how that gets handled. But there, uh, a good friend who is currently serving as a mission president said in his mission there are seven elders and two sisters who are uh, out to the mission and a number of others who are not out to the mission but out to him. And he said it really helps me to, as I ponder and pray the assignments to give them, to know that critical factor about them and to be able to think about who their companions will be and what wards and branches we assign them to and where their talents and, and their hearts can be most effectively used for the Savior. So those are some examples, and I think we have two minutes <laughs> in our time. So I'll open it up to any questions for any of the three of us that anyone has, um, or let you have a two-minute head start on your next one. Any comments, questions? Please. Right. I struggle with that because I, I definitely want to educate myself and my yeah. I think one, one way to start it, and Gina, come up and give your view on it. Oh, sorry. The question was, if, if you want to do a fifth Sunday in your ward, how could you go about it in a way that felt like it was a spiritual lesson, not a political one, if I'm using my words? So one way, I think, is to use the website of uh, mormonandgay.churchofjesuschrist.org as your foundation stone to make sure that people in the, in the ward are aware of that resource and some of the information that's contained in there. And, and that can be a way I think that makes it feel comfortable that this really is a church lesson we're teaching. Um, and to add the, to that, I would invite um, LGBTQ people to come to that lesson and share experiences. Um, we've seen that the more, the more that people are exposed to LGBT people and the more narratives that we're sharing and people can hear and receive those messages, that's, that's where hearts are softened and, and change really happens. So. Other comments? Please. Uh, yeah. 
So I'm going to get out of the transgender kit. Can you go to transitioning from female and identify as non-binary? And I was just called as the teacher's form advisor. Um, I'm wondering if anyone has, if there are any policies or if anyone has experience with transgender kids attending um, the activities of the gender and national identity. So I, I will give you the version I have from an area authority, and somebody can trump that if they want to with something else you've heard. But, <laughs> but I might have an apostle in my back pocket. Um, <laughs> so if you've got first presidency, you win. Anyway, um, <clears throat> I was just to say, the, the guidance that I've heard is that, that if the individual is, is um, you know, trying to, to be an active part of and shares the desire to come closer to Christ. In other words, that, you know, that that's their perspective of engagement, that we should kind of live and let live. You know, just let people be where they will feel most comfortable, where they're likely to thrive. If, it, if they are a source of disruption or contention, you know, that might be a different story. But I, it's, it's, the question, I think, is not does it make other people uncomfortable. I think the question is, are the, is that individual doing their best to follow Christ? and is that their purpose in being there, then other people can learn how to be more comfortable. So who's got a first presidency in their pocket? <laughs> 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 okay. Yeah, not me. Any final comments? I, the other thing I would just say about Fifth Sunday again, because um, I, I, in your ward, you probably have people who are out. Uh, or you probably have parents of people who are out. And I think there's something really powerful about the witness of my neighbor. You know, that, that somebody who is, that I know, I know their heart, I love them, and they can tell me this thing that I may not know that they have grown through, the experience they've had that has brought them closer to the Savior. And I think that's probably the most powerful thing that can happen in those sessions. Hearts open when we really feel the authentic message of someone that we thought we knew and, and loved, and to find out that we can love them even more when we know them better. There's, um, as we leave, just want to let you know there's some resources on the back table from the Family Acceptance Project, which is um, out of San Francisco State University, but it's a, it's a way of helping families especially, but support groups more generally, be aware of behaviors that can help support individuals as they come out and save lives. And there's also, I think, some information from uh, parents and friends of lesbians and gays, PFLAG. There may be others back there as well, but things that might be useful to you as you head out. So thank you for being willing to spend time with us. Thank you, President Mayfield, for your time as well. And, um, and I think just in conclusion, would want <clears throat> all of us to, um, to feel grateful for a Savior who has uh, taught us the two great commandments and um, that as those who desire to be his disciples uh, that he has taught us that the sign of our discipleship is our love for one another and I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.